in this very short part of the talk, I'm basically just going to go through what the International Brain Lab or IBL uses for quality metrics. Um, and this is, you can sort of use this as an example of a lot of what Julie is talking about, of basically what we did is we sort of looked through a lot of our data in PHI um, and then decided on some quality metrics and thresholds for those that worked for our data. Um, and so I'm just going to, this is really a repeat of what Julie just said, but highlight a couple of different um, errors that we see in spike sorted um, neuropixels data. So the first is this false negatives idea of um, neurons that are missing spikes. This is just a screenshot from Phi here. So you've just seen this many times. But the idea here is thinking a lot when you're picking your quality metrics on what um, what type of impact not having that quality metric would have on your data and why whether that's relevant for the analysis you're doing. So for example, with false negatives, you would, if you include a neuron like this where you're missing all of these presumably waveforms down here that are below the spike detection threshold, you'd get an incorrect estimate of the neuron's firing rate. And so then you have a conclusion that the neuron is less or differently modulated than it would be otherwise by whatever your um, experimental variable is. And then on the other side, thinking about false positives, we're talking about contamination. Again, you basically are essentially including contaminating spikes. And so you get an incorrect estimate of your firing rate. Um, so I think the, the main kind of thing to, to take away from this is to take a look at your data, think carefully about what types of errors are important um, or might have an impact on the analyses you're interested in doing, and then make sure that you have quality metrics in place for those. Um, so with that, we basically decided to focus on three different quality metrics for the IBL data. Um, the uh, I'm going to focus today on the first two. The, the third one is just a median amplitude threshold to get rid of neurons that have very low amplitudes. Um, just to reiterate, um, Julie mentioned that was important. Um, OK, so the first uh, amplitude cutoff metric um, is to look at this idea of missed spikes. Um, the, the estimate that you have is uh, lower because of missed spikes based on your amplitude histogram. Um, so this is here again, um, basically one way that people historically have, have dealt with this is to fit a Gaussian. So this is a very similar example to what Julie just showed, um, of fitting a Gaussian to these um, uh, histogram of spikes across time. You can do this in, in um, different epochs, as Julie mentioned, or you can do this overall. We wanted, um, as we were looking at our data, we noticed that a lot of the distributions here, even though they were above the spike detection threshold, were non-Gaussian. So we wanted a way to do this without assuming a Gaussian fit. Um, and so what we did is we looked at, so this is just replotting an example neuron here where the template amplitude spikes that come out of kilosort are here on the left. This is across the entire recording on the x-axis here. And then this is just the same data just collapsed into a histogram where you can see that this does look pretty cut off. And so the way that we compute this instead of fitting a Gaussian is we look at the, um, this set of bins up by the top here, and we compare this uh, very first bin to that set of bins. Um, and we determine whether with certain parameters, this low bin is an outlier relative to the distribution of these um, higher bins. So um, this is an example where when we compare this first bin to the distribution of these green bins, again, this is a bit confusing because it's a distribution within a distribution, um, but we just want to check that this red bin um, is not an outlier within um, this distribution and that it's within a, a few uh, standard deviations of the mean here. Um, and so this is an example of a neuron that passes that. Again, this is basically just us looking at what the standard metrics are, looking through some of our data. Of course, we can't manually curate all of the data because there's too much data. And so picking something that worked really well for our data and then going back again to Phi and checking that um, this metric does really what we want it to do. Um, okay, and I know we're really behind on time, so I'm gonna try to sort of rush through this, but please, uh, happy to answer questions afterwards. Um, so the second, metric that we use is a sliding refractory period metric. Um, so this is addressing the contamination uh, side of things or false positives. Um, it's an ISI or refractory period violation metric. Um, so just to state again, the way that people have typically looked at this is they've plotted the autocorrelogram of a neuron. So this is just um, time since the previous spike computed for each spike. So this is a, if you're used to looking at autocorrelograms, 
Um, this is a pretty contaminated one where you can see there's a lot of spikes that fall here between the um, the sort of standard refractory period of two milliseconds that's given. So typically what's done is you set that two millisecond refractory period, you count up the number of spikes that are here, um, you use some computation to tell you how much contamination that is relative to the firing rate of the neuron, and you set them some threshold, for example, 10%, you say we, uh, we don't want there to be more than 10% contamination of our neurons. Um, the problem we found with this type of metric um, is that we were setting out to, a few years ago now, um, record all over the brain in many different brain regions where um, we weren't sure that the refractory period would be two milliseconds everywhere. And in fact, it isn't. So here are just some example neurons recorded from visual cortex, hippocampus, and thalamus. And I just want to draw your attention to this third example neuron here. Um, you can see that its refractory period actually looks quite clean in the middle here, but it looks like it has a much shorter refractory period than two milliseconds. And we were concerned about this because this type of neuron would fail the previous refractory period metric, but we think it looks pretty nice and would like to include it. And so the idea here is to do the same thing, compute a level of contamination and, and try to get rid of neurons that do have contamination, but do that without imposing that assumption of two millisecond refractory period. Um, okay. Uh, the point here is if we look at across a few different data sets, um, we do notice that in thalamus, there are shorter, overall shorter refractory periods. Um, and you can really just generally see that there's differences across different brain areas in the refractory period. That was sort of the motiv motivation for this. Um, so I'm going to super quickly walk through this, um, the algorithm here. Basically, we look at the autocorelogram of a neuron. This is just an example neuron. Um, I'm only showing the right side of it. That's why it's not symmetric here. Um, we pick a, a time point here. I'm using a time point of one millisecond, and we just count up the spikes until that point. And then we can look at the expected distribution of observed violations given a contamination level. Meaning if I say we want less than 10% contamination, what is the distribution of um, number of spikes that I expect to observe under that condition? That's this dark blue line here. And then the probability of observing fewer than the number of spikes we did observe is this shaded region here. Um, and so this gives us a, a basically a probability of observing the number of spikes we did observe given a level of a certain level of contamination. Um, we now can do this for different time points. So now I'm doing this at an example time point of 1.5 milliseconds, of 2.2 milliseconds. And what you can see is for each of these, we get this probability of observing that number of spikes. And we can plot one minus or 100 minus that to get the confidence that we have that the neuron has less than or equal to 10% contamination. So I'm just plotting these three example points here um, along the line. The dashed line here is 90%, which is our, our picked threshold for this. Um, and typically, we actually don't just do this for 10% contamination here. We do this for all possible values of contamination. And what you get is this matrix where um, the y-axis is the value of contamination. The x-axis is the time since the most recent spike. And here we've computed, the, the important thing here is the z-axis here is confidence, um, a confidence that our neuron is less contaminated than this value of contamination. So for 10% contamination, we kind of march along this horizontal red line. That's this, this slice that you see here is you going across this and getting all the z-values here. Um, and just check that there are time points where the neuron is less contaminated than that, and that you're more than 90% confident that you have less contamination than that. Um, and in that way, this is just another example neuron. You want to know that at least in one time point, and here across many time points indeed, you're more than 90% confident that you have less contamination than that. Um, what this allows us to do is to um, include neurons that have potentially shorter refractory periods. So this is an example neuron that looks like by eye, it has maybe a one millisecond refractory period, and it's pretty clean within that, but would certainly fail a previous metric with setting a refractory period of two millisecond because it has a lot of spikes here. But when we do our matrix computation and check the confidence, we're more than 90% confident that there's no contamination at these values here. And so we're able to pass this neuron. Okay, and so the, the overall uh, idea here is that we still fail highly contaminated neurons, and we also will fail very low firing rate neurons where we aren't able to 
have enough confidence that there's low contamination because we don't have enough spikes to compute it. Um, there's sort of a workaround for that, which I don't have time to talk about, but happy to talk about after. But the point is that neurons that have these shorter refractory periods or different refractory periods from two milliseconds are now able to pass. Um, okay, I know I really sped through that, but I just, um, here are the actual code resources for this. So we have a quality metrics um, repository on GitHub where we have this coded up both in MATLAB and Python. Um, feel free to check that out and, and let me know if you have any questions. Um, and here are some of the other resources that uh, Julian Alessio talked about. Um, and that is all, so I'm happy to take questions.